Oh, Good evening, one. everyone. Good evening. Oh, look how many are. We're going to be um, we're going to be um, asking everyone to mute themselves at at the beginning and and uh, to remain muted um, throughout. Um, that way, if there's some background noises, we uh, we won't have to disrupt anything. We're just going to give a, a few minutes for people to to come in. We still have a, a number of people working their way into the meeting, um, but we are. Very, uh, it's a I panel discussion that Danny's so going to be muting people. So if um, if you are if you are muted already, terrific. Thank you. Um, if if not, then uh, and if you want to do that, then that is helpful. If not, we're happy to do that for you. If that would be a help. It is first of all wonderful to see so many friends here, uh, members of the congregation. Um, uh, friends of members of the congregation, um, I think friends of April and uh, and Kiyomi as well. Um, so we are just delighted to have all of you here. Um, one of the things that we are going to recommend that you do is you'll probably be able to see things best if you're on a speaker view rather than a um, than the gallery view. The gallery view gives you all the little boxes. The speaker view gives you the box of the person whom is speaking. And I think that will make it um, a little bit easier for, for people to, to see, um, uh, to see uh, um, a Kiyomi and April and to, and to hear what they have to say. So, um, so I think we're going to start in just another moment. There's still some people who are coming on. So um, as long as we're here and waiting, I'm just going to ask if everyone would please rise for the Barahu. Let's see. Okay, thank you, Susan Drapkin. Thank you, Rabbi Lotker and Daniel Nathan. Yeah, it's good. Some people, I, mean, it's, I still got it. I still got it, even with uh, <laughs> Don Kiyomi. Yeah, yeah, all right, yeah. Um, it's nice to know that uh, yeah, you don't lose it, even with all of the, the challenges. Okay, so um, I think you can sit down now. Please be seated. And, uh, and um, but you know what? I actually kind of do want to start with a blessing um, because in some ways I think that, that, you know, when we talk about Torah in Judaism, we talk about it both as the text, uh, the written Torah, then the oral Torah, um, the, the uh, Mishnah and the Gemara and all sacred texts in Judaism. But I also think in, in some ways... Um, this too is a kind of Torah. So I just want to start all of you at home, if you know the blessing that's terrific, um, the blessing for the study of Torah is Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Kitshanu B'Mitzvotah V'Tzivanu La'asok B'Divrei Torah, since I think we are going to be studying Torah here today. So um, I just want to start with a, a few comments to to uh, frame um, what we're gonna be doing, at least my sense of what we're gonna be doing. First of all, besides welcoming everyone who is here tonight um, viewing the discussion in person and for everyone who's watching it on the recording, um, the fact that you are paying attention at all says a great deal. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Barry Diamond. I'm the rabbi at Temple Adat Elohim. Um, and I'm pleased to be joined by Dan Cooperberg, who's a former Temple board member, former mayor of Agoura Hills several times over. Um, and he has been helping to coordinate some of our explorations of race at Temple Adat Elohim, along with Marsha Gordon and our social action committee chair, and working with an excellent committee of very thoughtful people for which we are very grateful. Um, and before we introduce the panelists, um, I want to tell you about how I think about these discussions on race within our community and why we're so pleased that Kiyomi and April are joining us. Um, I think it's important for people to think through the issues regarding race in our society in order for us to commit to doing something. And that means that we have to be able to be honest and thoughtfully explore some of the ideas that are in our culture. Um, and these ideas lead to questions um, such as, 
Are we using the term racism differently? What is structural racism? Does it really exist? Is there an inherent unfairness in our society? Do I need to do anything about it? Aren't anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism just two sides of the same coin? Um, there are two ways that we can ask these questions. One is with the answer already in mind. When I say, I know what I know, and I don't want to know anything different, um, that's an orientation that I think is probably not going to be helped by this discussion or any others. But if we come to this discussion with an open heart and an open mind and say, first, I want to understand this situation from a different perspective, then I believe we can come to a deeper understanding of ourselves, our community, and our country. Now, Kiyomi in April, one of the many things that brings you to this discussion is that you are one of us. You understand what it's life, what it's like to live as a synagogue attending Jew in the Kineho Valley. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that you are one of us. But as black women, we also know that you have insights and experiences that we, we just don't have access to. Pleased and grateful some of your experiences with the white members of the Jewish community. I also think it's important to mention that just today we saw a, a video of another unarmed black man named Jacob Blake who was shot in the back by police. And I remember after the Pittsburgh shooting of the synagogue how many clergy members reached out to offer their condolences and support, even if it was all the way across the country. And even after the Christchurch shooting of the mosque, a whole group of us went to the local mosque to offer our support. I want to acknowledge that a black man was shot and we want to show our support to you by praying May the one who blessed our mothers and our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, bring Jacob Blake back from suffering his injuries to a rifuash lema, to a full healing. It's so unfortunate that a prayer like this must be said so many times in our country, but that's part of why we are here to, what we're here to talk about. So I want to turn to Dan, who will be carrying the load of the questions, which allows me to share some of my thoughts as they arise and to read any questions that you might have. So if you have questions along the way, I want to invite you to please feel free to put them into the chat. And if there's something that we can weave into the conversation, we will. If not, we will reserve them towards the end of our um, of our discussion. We're expecting to um, be here for about an hour and 15 minutes more or less. So with that, thank you and, and Dan. Great. Thank you, Rabbi. Uh, let me introduce our, our two speakers. Uh, Kiyomi Kowalski is a former Marine. She has her law degree with public service distinction from Loyola Law School. She's on the staff of the Law Project of Los Angeles, serves on the Las Virginas Unified School District Curriculum Council, and created an anti-racism task force at Valley Outreach, Outreach Synagogue. Kiyomi is also a candidate this November for the Las Virginas School Board. April Powers is the managing director of First Impression Rx, a full service consulting firm that helps Fortune 500 nonprofits, governmental agencies, manages, manage differences through training, diversity, and inclusion strategies. Previously, she led inclusion efforts at Nestle USA and Amgen. April is also the Chief Equity and Inclusion Officer for the Society of Children Book Writers and Illustrators. So tonight is another step in TAE's journey involving race, racial inequality, and racial injustice. You remember we had a congregation-wide discussion with breakout groups in June, and then in July and August, a lot of us read the book White Fragility by Robin DiAngelo and had book club discussions. Tonight, we are talking with two black Jewish women who live locally, belong to local shuls, and are involved in racial education. 
after tonight, in the upcoming weeks, starting in mid-September, we're going to be watching, hopefully as a congregation, the, um, the movie 13th about incarceration and criminal justice, and the movie Selma about the fight for voting rights, and pretty timely for those. Through Weaving through those are discussion groups, and you have a chance for us to talk together among ourselves in discussion groups on the same link of the same uh, flyer that you saw this link. Um, there's a link also to join a discussion group at TAE. Hopefully, if you can't find that, because you because it came yesterday, um, go to TAE, uh, find a, a TAE Engage and find a discussion group. There will be four discussion groups total. And that hopefully we're hoping at the end of October to have a congregation wide meeting to discuss what we can do next, what we can do as a temple, what we've learned and how we put it into action. But tonight our job is to listen and learn. So let me ask you, Kiyomi and April, first of all, thank you again for, for being here. Um, from my reading this summer and the little education I've gotten uh, over the, the, the last 61 years, or at least this summer, I've now learned that racism and racial issues are really white people's problems. Um, these are white society created issues uh, and racism is a white person's problem. Yet, here I am talking with two black women to a largely white audience about white people's problems. So am I a hypocrite or is this okay? So, shall I take that, April, uh, initially? Absolutely. Uh, first, <laughs> first, I want to start by saying thank you for having me. I've been on a synagogue tour lately. Um, I am particularly passionate about this issue. Um, and I'm particularly passionate about my law school, which isn't Loyola, it's Southwestern. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> either way, though, I thank you for having me. And Dan, you know I can't let you get away with anything. Um, I will say, uh, as a as a black woman, clearly, I don't even have to preface that because you can see that. Um, uh, the, the fact is, is that we can't uh, dismantle something that we didn't build. Um, whiteness was created uh, at, at, to otherize a group of people, um, including myself. And uh, we, we um, don't have the tools to dismantle the things that we didn't have the tools to build in the first place. So I will just say it most simply like that and we'll get into it more. April, do you have anything? I do, I do. I think that, that there are systems in place, there are invisible systems, and for those of you who read White Fragi Fragility, you know this, that uh, benefit certain people. And if the people who are benefited most by it say, you know what, I'm taking a step back, I'm not going to benefit from this, I'm going to lift up someone else, then we are slowly dismantling that, that thing. We know you know, Kiyomi and I talk about this regularly. We know that some, and there's going to be another black man shot tomorrow, and there's there's going to be another lynching somewhere else. And and we've been talking about it. It's just astonishing that it's taken center stage. We we have been screaming about it since slavery, um, but only when we link and unite with each other is it really does it really have an impact. And the people who have the most power and the most to benefit from the situation taking a stance can change it. Well, thank you for helping us as we start through this journey or wherever step we are on our way. Um, so let's talk about our commonality. Uh, most of us Jews have experienced some forms of uh, anti-Semitic or uh, we're familiar with anti-Semitic acts. We've had experienced ourselves or other people we know, but we're probably not as familiar with racist attacks and racial slurs other than what we've heard. Before we talk about the differences between anti-Semitic attacks and anti-Black attacks, can you comment on the commonality, the shared experiences of anti-Semitism and, and racism? Absolutely. I think one of the things I want to say is, for me, you can see what I look like. Um, not everybody knows I'm Jewish. Not everyone knows I'm Black. And I've heard I go into spaces where I hear horrible things about everything that I am and all of my family members because I also have Latinx and LGBTQ plus family. So as Jews, oftentimes, I'm sure there are a lot of times that some of you walk into spaces and places where you hear horrible things about Jews or you read horrible things about Jews and you think to yourself, well, how could you not know? Um, 
you know, so, so that's, that's one thing, one area of commonality is that sometimes you'll blend in. I don't think Kiyomi and I blend in as white people, you know, but, but we certainly um, can be called out and, and hear horrible things, anti-Semitic things right in our faces. And of course we speak out on those things when we have the energy, because sometimes you don't always have the bandwidth, am I right? Um, and, and if you look at the black Jewish experience, black churches mostly, I'd say 70% use um, the Old Testament. We, the story of Exodus, the slavery, the, the whole history, the, the oppression, mm -hmm. um, the murder, we, we have a shared experience that allowed us to be unified for the civil rights movement. And I said this in one of my LinkedIn posts, when, when, when we are taken and torn apart, whom does it benefit? Yeah. It doesn't benefit I, yeah. us to be anti-Semitic or anti-Black, not a single one of us, because when we're unified, we can do some powerful things. I, I agree completely. Um, I, I think that that shared experience um, of, of slavery and I mean, my favorite holiday is, is Passover. I tell the story. I, it's a huge thing. I make a longer table every year. Um, I think it's really important to Lador Vador, uh, tell that story um, and uh, pass it on from generation to generation. Um, but I think it's important to also understand that uh, it is similar so that we can have that amount of empathy um, uh, as Jews. Because I, I live a bifurcated life, right? Like as, as a Jew, I see one thing as a black woman, as, as a black person, as a, as a black woman, I see another thing. So these intersections is what um, we'll eventually talk about, I believe. Um, it's, uh, I, I think it's important that we utilize our common um, feelings so that we can empathize with each other, but um, not expect that those uh, particular uh, feelings will uh, match the other. And I don't think we're in some like Olympics, right? Like there's no, uh, you know, uh, diversity or uh, lack thereof of Olympics, right? We're not trying to compete with each other, but there is a, a, a way um, that we say as, as, as Jews, we sympathize with the story of slavery because uh, that is our, our story and our history. Um, but also understanding that people have lived that history. Uh, it's not so long ago. The history was, is, is now, right? I, would, I wanna add one other thing, right? It's like less than two, you know, it's, it's in hundreds of years, not the thousands of years. And, mm -hmm. um, and I get a lot of feedback from, from my Jewish, you know, members and people in, you know, just in the Twitterverse why are we talking about black lives? There's anti-Semitism and other things going on. But what I say to that is, when was the last time you were afraid, mortally afraid of being pulled over by the police? And, and Kiyomi has a list of 25 questions that for those of you going into the chat groups later that sign up for that will receive that. But you do, we do wanna ask ourselves when we talk about the difference you're, you're generally not afraid for your lives. You generally can blend into those majority white spaces. You generally aren't um, in fear of being discriminated against, um, you know, in certain situations or chased down in a store or followed um, in the same way that we were, in the same way that I was when getting my engagement ring, you know, and my husband wasn't and he noticed very quickly, oh, I've never had this experience. And, um, and so it is a very uh, eye-opening experience to know that there are people who are being discriminated against and fear for their lives because of the color of their skin that they didn't choose. Can I just add, add one quick thing? I remember in college, I was driving and I saw a black man in the, the car next to me and I realized he was always black. And I felt like I didn't always have to be Jewish to the outside world. So for 20 plus years, I wore a kippah all the time. And there was only one time when someone, you know, made some kind of a, a nasty comment. But even as I, I, I felt maybe like some anti-Semitism here and there, it was just of such a different order. It was just, there's no comparison between the experiences that I had and the experiences that I think the average black man or woman has. And I would, I would ask for our members to grab a kippah, put it on your head and walk around and see what the experience is. Because I know that I could always take that kippah off. I could always change my name to, to Smith and not be viewed as, as being Jewish. And, and I thought the experience is just 
not the same. Thank I, you. I, I think it's also interesting too. Yeah, I, I, I love that. Um, wearing the kippah definitely says I'm Jewish. Like uh, I want you to see that. Um, I think it's, it, it's important to realize that uh, it's, it's not, <laughs> this is oh. Moses. Uh, because again, my favorite uh, holiday is Passover and we had a fictional baby named Moses uh, when David and I met my partner and uh, we ended up naming him Moses. We said, when we have baby Moses and there was a baby Moses. So there you go. Um, <laughs> um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's important that um, we first of all understand that we can't uh, put put things down like we can't I can't put down my blackness there's no way in the world that I'm going to be able to pass as anything else um, but a black woman and I I I think it's I think we have to see that what privilege there is in passing um, and and I, I will even say, go this far is that there are certain negative stereotypes that contribute to um, uh, the suppression of Black people and, and their negative stereotypes. There are many um, non-white people who have positive stereotypes attributed to them. So it may just be like, I'll take that, right? Um, we uh, there there is no positive stereotype, unfortunately. Um, there are very few. I, I think this uh, athleticism you know, we might be good at sports. Yeah, and that's like uh, that becomes its own. Let that us, becomes its own matter. Let us entertain let you, us entertain right? You so and be the uh -huh. and yeah, and so like I. I I think it's even easier when it's like, oh, you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer because you're a Jewish person. And it's like, oh, well, uh, you must be on welfare because you are a black woman. Like that, you know, or you, you must have, you know, it, all the negative stereotypes that come with it, I, it yeah, are, are more difficult to live with than some, some more positive stereotypes. I want to say that. And then there, then there are minorities that are white adjacent. I would, I would put Jewish people in the white adjacent model minority category, along mm -hmm. with, you know, other, uh, you know, persons of color that would be maybe Asian being the model minority. And, and, and that's also, that's heavy and unfair. But as, as Kiyomi said, W would I rather have some stereotypes that were more positive for me and my peeps? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you. A thousand percent. <laughs> Sadly, um, I'm like, any, any positive stereotype, please hand them this way. Save my life. <laughs> Let me say a little bit on the, the Jewish theme. Um, and uh, let me ask you, you can choose if you don't want to answer this. Knowing that you're probably the one of a very small few or maybe the only black person when you attend synagogue at our local mm -hmm. synagogues do you always feel comfortable attending synagogue is there and if you don't if you yeah. don't is there something that could be done to make you feel better i do I, yeah, yeah. oh wait, who's, who's, no i'll let you go ahead april i'll, okay. I'll see so i do now um because i'm just i i don't care anymore <laughs> Um, and it's, it's not because people make me feel welcome or because people don't ask, are you, um, how can I help you? I mean, it, it depends on which synagogue I attend, I go to, right? The ones where everybody knows me, TAE, everybody knows me. Um, VOS, everybody doesn't know me and I, I get a few more stares. Um, same with, you know, but, but there are synagogues where they, where I, they know me already. But when I first started going, I would get weird questions um, asked of me at like social events, like if you if you were in um, this certain place, like Simi Valley, and you saw skinheads, would you tell them you were Jewish? And I was said, well, oh, I wow. think if the way that I look, I wouldn't even need to address whether or not I was Jewish. You know, there would be these interesting questions that people would ask me, or I know people have been asked, like, oh, directed to the kitchen, or asked, you know, how can we help you, and and those types of things. And I definitely feel more eyes on me at times. Um, and certainly when I bring my family that is multicultural, my, my nieces and nephews are Mexican and Honduran and even darker than I am. So we, um, we get looks. Yeah. And, and, and I just want people to be aware that we're aware, even if we're not directly looking at you, we can feel it. 
Um, yeah, I, yeah, it's, yeah, it's something that you feel. Um, I am the only uh, Black member of my synagogue, but I got to tell you, I'm on everything. I'm on the Board of Jewish Education. I am on the thing. So if you don't know me, I, I don't know what synagogue you're attending. I'm at Valley Outward Synagogue, and uh, when I go to the Mahjong table, and you know I love me some Mahjong, okay, like I... I <laughs> I was made to be a Jewish old lady, okay? You're um, my mother-in-law. <laughs> man, I love me some Mahjong. I'm so sad about missing it. I, the whole 2020 card is gone for me. I'm not playing it. I have no idea what's going on. Those of you who know, you know. Um, so, I like, I'll come to the Mahjong table, and it's a, I, I play with groups in, in Calabasas with groups of women who are much older than me, of course, because <laughs> what, what young person is, or what younger person is playing uh, Mahjong in the middle of the day on the Thursday? Um, but I am, uh, yeah, well, I'll bring you along. Uh, and uh, I'll sit down, and some people who are, are new to the table um, are very surprised when I say that I'm Jewish, and they say, oh, well, when did you convert? Um, and and I will say, I in fact am a convert. I'm very proud to be a convert. My one of my uh, Hebrew names is Ruth. Like I'm very proud to be a convert and named after our first convert. Um, but a white woman who says that she is Jewish is not assumed to have converted, right? And so that's like the, the things I I think that you, I I think that we are always authorized or strangers, even when we uh, lean in and do our best and we're on all the boards and I've done, you know, many speeches at my synagogue and done many things. I'm always like, how can I help you? And, you know, people say, how can I help you? And I'm like, dude, I've been here for how many years? So yeah, it's, it's sad, but like, I, and I've had some hor horrifying things happen. People have commented on, um, the color of my son's skin saying how lucky they are that he's not dark or how lucky we are that he's not dark which means he's we're lucky you're oh it's nice that he's not dark like you really was the con continuation of this sentence um so i've had some horrifying things occur but i still make my presence known i don't always feel comfortable but like i think uh, what i'm learning about myself is when i feel uncomfortable that's when i lean in that much more that discomfort drives me in a way that makes I, i'm gonna make you feel uncomfortable instead <laughs> so people say when did you convert and i'm like why would you ask that oh and i think <laughs> yeah. and and you converted but but you converted before even finding David, right? Like that was something that you did on your own with no. That was oddly that, enough. I I knew David when I converted. He begged me not to convert. I wanted to. I've always felt connected to Judaism, and I always knew like I need to be Jewish. And um, uh, I had a prior husband. Long story. Uh, and uh, I used to always joke around. I'm like, the only thing that's wrong with you is that you're not Jewish. There were many things wrong with him, but uh, that was one of the many things. Um, <laughs> and um, when I met David, I mean, it was kismet in so many ways. Um, and he was like, please don't convert. I know you're going to be like the, you know, on the synagogue board and do all the things. Please don't take away my bacon. <laughs> you know what, I'm doing it, this is what I want, and I, and I did that, um, but it was, I just always felt a calling to be Jewish, and it, he was a good excuse. Well, much as, much as I'm, go I'm going to forego my three follow-up Mahjong questions. <laughs> can I, wait, can I say one more thing about f feeling unsafe in Jewish spaces? Absolutely. Was getting on the plane at Elal at the LAX airport, and even though some people think I look Yemenite and Middle Eastern and some kind of Israeli to mm -hmm. everybody at all the guards at Alal, I did not. And so I had to Baruch Atadonai Eluheinu Melechalam. I literally had to sing in the middle of the airport, not once, not twice, but three times to show that I knew the Shema and like everything because they were like they couldn't put together that I was black and Jewish. It was like what is going on right here? Like, who's Jewish? Who, what, who are you visiting? And I was with the tour. I was with Aisha Torah. And like the whole line is passing me by. People are approaching me with guns. And to myself, I'm thinking, is this how Israel is going to be to me? Like, will people be stop up? Uh, Israel is lovely. I mean, it was amazing. I, I, it's one of my favorite places on the planet earth. And it, but, but that being my intro, 
um, being stopped and questioned while everybody else um, just kept passing me by. I was worried I was gonna miss my flight. Um, that was a thing for me because people with guns were approaching me and calling other people with guns to come see what I look like. I was an oddity. I want, I want to ask one, one last question in the Jewish black relationship here. Um, I've heard you say and write that the Black Lives Matter movement is anti-Semitic and anti-Israel. Yet I know that the American Reformed Jewish organizations and leadership say very, very clearly that Black Lives Matter is a Jewish value. So what are your thoughts, not for you know 20 minutes, but just what are your thoughts on, on, on dealing with the uh, aspects of, of BLM that we may not all agree with? You've never heard me say or write that, but uh, no, I, <laughs> is there anybody else? <laughs> well, and even in our local paper, there was a there was a letter to the editor last week. So yeah, yeah, people are saying it and, think, and thinking it. So how do we? So how yeah, do we it, I and I, you know, I'm very sad uh, about the. the and I think April puts it so perfectly. Like, who benefits from us being divided? Um, and there, I, I think it's sad that there is some some leadership. Uh, in the Black Lives Matter movement, that is, um, that that has been anti-Semitic, and I am, I, I, I'm, I certainly distance myself from that. But I will say that there's there's two things, and I live in a bifurcated life, and I'm asking you to, right, and all of my fellow Jews here. You can say Black Lives Matter, and not be a member of Black Lives Matter, right? Um, you can realize that Black Lives Matter without upping. The, the the cause um, that they that they represent. I think Black Lives Matter is just a statement to say, and an imperfect statement, but it's a statement to say that we have a problem in the United States with all. You don't understand and uh, freedom and justice for all. All the alls did not include me, right? Like so, what we need to understand is that. We can deal with the anti-Semitic parts of any entity as a separate if issue. But when we see that people, there's an injustice happening, if there's an injustice there, there's an injustice everywhere. And we as Jews are called to act on that, period. One of the things I think, I think, I think we have to have to say the words Black Lives Matter. We have to say it out loud and repeat it because, you know, if I'm just for me, then who am I, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things we know is that when Heschel and Martin Luther King died, our unity became more and more divided. And we, we, we need to get back to where we were in the 60s and, and, mm -hmm. and figure out a, a path. But what I will say, um, and because and we're, we're all friends here and we're going to be honest with each other, right? the Jewish voice for black lives has been really silent. And moreover, there have been, you know, Jewish people who have, whether it's, you know, landlords or employers or whatever, who, you know, black people have experience with Jewish people that has been rather confronting. And so that for, for black people to overlay their experience and say, well, I can imagine what, what's going on in Palestine. It's not a hard, it's, you know, it's, it just takes an empathic stretch of the imagination to say, I can see why, I can see why they might feel that way. Because since the 60s or late 60s, we haven't been a voice for the, the oppressed. I'm not saying nobody has, but as a people, the way that we mobilized in the 60s for this injustice that we know is wrong, we haven't seen it. And so to have an oppressed person, type of person, not support another t oppressed type of person, there's gonna be some friction. And yes, yeah. it's exacerbated in the media. Yeah. Do you think that Nick Cannon speaks for me and Kiyomi? <laughs> like more so any rapper any rapper speaks for the black majority that no. is not going to happen and the people who are pressing that button for you mm -hmm. or pressing it's like when i went to the women's march in dc and somebody they and apparently one of the women's march people was also anti-semitic and yeah. they called that out so we were all supposed to anybody jewish was supposed to not participate no 
no. I'm going to the Women's March with my mother yep. and my niece. And Me I'm too. going to support that because I care about women and you're not going to get me off my point and off my topic yeah. because somebody in the group is anti-Semitic. We yeah. can get that person out of the group just like they did. You, mm -hmm. you push those people out, but you stick with what matters, which is the message. And I'm going to one-up you, April. Like, Do we it. have to have a seat at the table if we're going to call them on it. So, like, if you see some anti-Semitism in an organization, or if I see racism in an organization, this is why I'm running for office right now. If I see racism, I'm going to go have a seat at that table and make sure it doesn't happen. That is what we do, um, because that is how you move the needle. You say, I'm going to have a seat at that table because I want to make sure that this person and that they're... Um, that, that what uh, the, the, their platforms and that their policies do not reflect anti-Semitism. I'm going to be there. You don't omit yourself. And I want to say what All Lives Matter means when we hear it as Black people or BIPOC people, which stands for Black Indigenous People of Color. We already know All Lives Matter. And when you look at the Constitution and you look at some of the amendments and you look at some of the laws, they talk about all lives but they don't but really they don't matter. Include us. So we do have to call out the lives that don't matter. And when we hear all lives matter, um, it, it sort of says to us, it's, it's, it's like a dog whistle that says to us, you're, you're telling me that then that black lives don't. And, and there's a differentiator. So I just wanna be, be clear. So when you, when you hear people say that, that's what black people hear. Um, when when we hear that all lives matter or blue yeah. lives matter we, we never said that they didn't they're not mutually exclusive things at all of course we believe yeah. all lives matter but saying black lives matter acknowledges that we're getting murdered and put in prison at a much higher rate than the rest of the population other than and we have a historical problem with all at the begin at the beginning of this presentation rabbi mentioned that jacob blake was shot he was shot but today in, in Wisconsin, seven times by the yes, police. Yes, and, yes. And, and if he had been wearing a yarmulke, we'd feel differently. And if there was a different Jacob who two days ago had been shot, and a week ago there was a different David who had been shot. Yeah. If it was Yaakov. Aaron that was shot. And I have killed. a Yaakov. And, and, and <laughs> it happened every week, every month, mm -hmm. not just like since March, but for months and years and decades and, and the last four centuries in this country, maybe we'd have a better understanding of Black Lives Matter as, as a phrase and as a movement. And if we join the movement, if we get involved and have a seat at the table, like Kim said, yes. people, under, people understand each other when we see each other. And that's, you know, rabbis are taking risks sometimes and just going and being a part of this and then they, they, we have a chance to talk to people and say, why, are, why do you feel this way about us? And you can have the dialogue because people are just a collection of stories. And once you know my story, it humanizes me for you. And you can maybe see me better and see me as a human. And, and then step off that, that platform, which is anti-Semitic or anti-Muslim you know, Muslim or anti-Black or anti-anything. You, you've both mentioned uh, different stories already, personal stories. Kiyomi, you mentioned about, someone mentioned about the color of your son's skin. Uh, mm -hmm. April, you mentioned about LL, or you've mentioned about, you know, being followed in a shop, you know, when you're buying your wedding ring, I think. You know, those experiences we don't have. I mean, I don't have those kind of experiences. I've never been pulled over for being white. Speaking, <laughs> yes, but I don't think I've ever been pulled over for being white. Can you share a few more of these types of things just to, so we can have a better understanding because we don't experience them. I've experienced police brutality. I don't know a single black man in my life and most of these are highly educated. I'm talking Berkeley, Harvard, Yale people. I don't know a single black man that doesn't get pulled over multiple times a year. I mean, just in the chat, just raise your hand. You can do a little reaction. We have these reaction buttons that you can click on with a hands up right. or a thumbs up. Um, how many of you have been pulled over once this year? In the last, even in the last one year? And somebody can tell me and type in the chat how many people we see. And if you are pulled over, you can type in the chat, how stressful is that when you get pulled over? You, you might be on the way to work, on the way to see your grandchildren, 
on the way to, um, to go see a play. And that delay then makes you late. But not only does it make you late, but your hands might be shaking or you might be running like Jacob did, knowing that, oh my God, this could be my last day on earth. I spoke with a police officer in my neighborhood this morning and he and I were talking about each other and I thanked him for protecting our neighborhood. And we just got into the whole thing and he just said, I remember distinctly pulling over a black man and he made me follow him in Calabasas to a public space and his arms were shaking like this. He had just bought his car and they hadn't, they had forgotten to give him the plates. And, or they, he, they hadn't, they just hadn't put the plates on yet. And, and he just said, I felt so bad. And, and I've experienced police brutality, you know, even as a teenager, I was thrown up, I, you know, have left parties and been the only car that hit, got a police baton hit on it because we were the only yeah. car of color in Bel Air or police coming to my best friend's house. When we just had two b black boys, we were all hanging out in high school and, and, and they came in guns drawn to a doctor's house in Beverly Hills, in the hills, and just said, we heard there was a robbery. And so when you call police on black people, um, please oh, be yes. sure that you know what you're doing because it is a, it's a, it could risk their lives, risk their lives. Um, as we've I know seen. my, yeah, my mom shared um, a story with me. I think she's on actually. My, hey mom. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> my mom shared a story about when she was young and this officer, and this is in Los Angeles, um, and this officer uh, really got rough with these kids for no reason. She um, asked him a question about something and he's like, get down and like pushed her away. And like, uh, I, the idea that for some people, black bodies are more expendable than other bodies. That is why we're here tonight, right? Like there, there is a, an idea in our, society that certain people, black and brown bodies usually, certain people are more expendable than other people. And it doesn't matter whether they're just um, trying to be a good Samaritan calling the police. Uh, trust me, a black man always thinks twice about calling the police, whether they're on the good side of things or not, uh, because of the, it, how it usually ends up. That's what we saw that with Megan the Stallion, right? She didn't call, yeah. she told the police that she stepped on glass because she didn't want to tell on the person because she she knew that they might all get shot if they knew that somebody had a gun. And I would so love it, like I would love a poll on who knows who Megan the Stallion is in this audience. <laughs> Google that. Yeah. And, and go watch her latest video. Go watch WAP, WAP, get on that. Yeah, so, so anyway, you, 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 you shot you, the foot. I'm sorry? You've just provided us with the first question for our discussion groups in two weeks. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you could do a whole discussion on um, the most recent Megan the Stallion hit. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things also, my, my, um, my dermatologist is one of the top dermatologists in the Conejo Valley. His name is Dr. Pierre, Dr. Pierre Skin Care, you know, but, and he always has, you go to Dr. Pierre, he's a black dermatologist. No, I was just, and yeah. He's, the, the doctor's name, Jen Love him. Anyway, he has to be, he and I've had this conversation. He, every time his son leaves the house, you know, and the, some black parents only let their kids dress a certain way, like no baggy pants, no, you know, if you're white and you're wearing a hoodie, you're a billionaire, right? It's not, yeah. so he, every time his son leaves the house has to tell him, and that's just a burden. It takes time. It takes energy. And, and it's, and it's just worrisome. Like people, why are you wearing that? It's the same as asking a woman who was raped, why'd you wear that dress? What were you wearing? And it's like, yeah. we have a culture too. So and, well, so you, yeah. and we're just weathered by it, like, right? Like they look up weathering and then you find out that we are as good as we look. Okay, trust me, because that is one thing that we, we got. <laughs> and we stay looking good. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the no weathering kidding. process ages us um, internally. We, we age faster. That is why we have the negative birth outcome uh, because we are constantly worried about our families and our lives. My son, who is a, just a guy in, uh, I was gonna use another word, but I'm gonna be nice, uh, in Calabasas, he's a 13 year old and he was skateboarding, uh, skateboarding around. And I told him, you know, you can't skateboard in this uh, private property, that is not okay. So please don't do that. But of course, because he's 13, he thinks he's smarter and knows better. So he's skateboarding and I come and pick him up. And I said, where are you? You know, 
oh, we're in the back of the Vons. This is uh, in Calabasas on um, Agora Road and uh, Las Virginas. I said, why are you in the back? So he gets in the car and I say, why were you in the back of, of the Vons? What's going on? Well, we were skateboarding back there. Well, wait a second. Er, why were you skateboarding back there? Oh, um, because, you know, the cop told us not to skateboard in the front. Like, and I was just like, wait, what? So you went, so you thought it was smart, black man in Calabasas, uh, you thought it was smart to go to the back with all of your friends and then uh, like, yeah, and ignore this, this police officer. And uh, he goes, yeah, but you know, whatever. And I'm like, no, it's not whatever. The cop comes back and says to him, hey, uh, I told you kids to stop. And, and I say to my son, why did you, what, then what happened then? And he goes, oh, I don't know. I ran. And I'm just like, okay, you know what? Even though it's not protocol for police to shoot people in the back, as we know, uh, what happened today is, is just as easy to happen in Calabasas. You could be shot in the back. And I'm going to tell you what, you're going to be a chalk outline because this is how I have to talk to my son. You're going to be a chalk outline and all of the rest of your friends are going to be home for dinner. How do you like that? That's the life we live. So, so that's Especially in these predominantly white communities. And I have to say, my, my boys are white presenting, but they, but they feel every bit black and every bit Jewish and their cousins are Latinx. So, so th I don't have the same situation as Kiyomi, although they are darker than a lot of their friends and a lot of their friends are kids of color. So, um, so I mean, so look, my kids are not blackety black, like I, you know, but they are, they are still, they, you can tell that they're not white kids from Calabasas. So the, the talk is a conversation that I never had to have with my sons. I told them to drive carefully, be respectful, but I never had to worry that, that they're going to get shot because of their skin color when pulled over by a police officer. Yeah. But are there any black people that you've ever heard of that do not have to have that conversation with their kids? I have not heard of one. And I think that if I did, I'd be like, wow, you're negligent. I, I would not know. I have not heard of one. And the, talk, and the talk means come home safely. Whatever you have to do, come home safely, right? No, like, ten and two, they are killing yeah. us. No, yeah. no, you have to tell a young person. The talk is this, mm -hmm. and 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 it's not it's not more happening more now. It's probably happening less now than it ever did. It's just it's just recorded. It's, it's just we have cameras now that tell us mm -hmm. what's happening. So so the talk is they are killing us for whatever reason, this country is set up in such a way that we, our lives are not valued. So police will use any reason to shoot you, arrest you, put you in jail um, for the rest of your life. Um, I know somebody who was put in jail for the rest of his life for a murder he didn't commit. And then they finally found the receipt that proved he wasn't there, but they didn't care. He didn't even have the right color car, um, but it ruined his life. You know, he was, it ruined his life being in prison. And you'll see tons of these stories um, around that. And you have that conversation with your children the second they start looking like men, or even maybe sometimes some people have it before, so it's not as shocking. And you don't have to have the conversation because a lot of people are living it and have seen things happen to a family member. Um, so, so your parents then have to explain why this happened to a family member. Um, and there's, what, what's that video? When did you stop loving my baby? Like there's a, there's a video. Oh, there's when a, is it, like basically, when did you stop thinking my baby was cute or whatever? Like, or yeah, like that, something that. like that, something along it's that line. Look for it. But, yeah. but it's black moms showing you, you think their babies are so cute. And then mm -hmm. you see them, the babies growing up and older and older. And then we're all afraid, right? And there's a great book called Mind Bugs that shows us why, you know, and the 13th, you're going to love the 13th. It's the number one thing I recommend to understand race relations in this country. But um, it's just, you know, we've all been shown images our whole lives. And we only get these like special books during one of the shortest month of the year that are all sad black stories and not about yes. black joy. Yeah. So it's, it's Rabbi, you want to say something? Yeah, I want to, I want to talk about, because I think um, one of the most, confusing and difficult things to talk about is this idea of structural or institutional racism. And it may not be the sexiest part, it may seem very abstract, but at least as I am learning, it seems to be 
kind of like the, the fundamental groundwork of the problems that we are facing as a society. I'm wondering if you could kind of, first of all, explain to people what does it mean when we talk about structural or systemic or institutional racism? It's so big. Yeah, I, I like to say, I, I, I like, I'll, I'm gonna lay the foundation and then I'm gonna let you pick it up because you're good at this, okay, friend? Um, I'm gonna say Band-Aids. I'm just gonna say Band-Aids. I want you to think of structural racism like this, is that um, whiteness is considered a default. So anything other than whiteness is an afterthought. Think about Band-Aids. Until recently, and I've yet to see them myself, but I hear there are, there's lore of such a thing. That, I bought uh, some. Band-Aids. Did you? Did you get them? I um, bought them from the original black man who invented that. Or maybe I love that. it. God love it. So I, I, Band-Aids have always been flesh colored. And think about flesh colored crayons too, like flesh colored. But whose colored flesh are those? So I have been, my whole 41 years of life, wearing flesh colored band-aids, but they were your color of flesh. They were never my color. That nude often is not nude for me. Uh, because, so they, it's, it's the idea that whiteness is uh, supreme and that it is the default for everything. And everything else is some afterthought variant of whiteness. Um, and when we think about it structurally, if your name is Jill Smith, they're going to look at your resume again. But if your name is Shaniqua Brown, there's a lot of connotations that come with that. That is structural racism. Go for it, April. I'm going to let you take it from there. I mean, it's, it's, so, it's so big that I could, t I could do an hour and a half talk on it. But all of, let's, because Kiyomi, you're running for school board, I'm, I'm just going to, and, and I work for the Society of Children's Book Writers, I'm just going to narrow it down to one small finite area for everyone. Let's just talk about schools and books. Yeah. Schools and books. The classics are European. The history books written by the victors, right? History belongs to the, belongs to those who win. So do we have black inventors? Do we have black joy? Do we have amazing sure. stories and a rich history and, and kings and queens and tribes and amazing things that happened in the black world, and I'm just, we're just talking about no. the black world right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. But we're not hearing about that. Our kids are left to wonder about black art. They're left to wonder about black books. They're left to wonder about the black experience. And, and Jews, we have the PJ library, which was so amazing. Yes. I mean, if you don't have the, if your grandchildren or children do not have the PJ library, please, please make sure that they're getting those free Jewish books by the Harold Greenspoon Foundation. They're amazing. But, but just like, you know, the, the history, you, we have a more recent history of 5,000 years we can trace back. But for African Americans and Afro Latinos, that history was stripped. And so the, the, the system, therefore, that we find ourselves in is not reflective of our experience in any way, which then tells us that our experience and our lives are not of, as, as much of value. Um, and then we see in that who gets elected for president, who gets, we did have a black president and that was great for black boys, but for black girls, we have, you know, Michelle. But Obama's it's like great. one president out of how many, what, 47 45. presidents we've got? Yeah. Like, so 45, yeah. Can, so, I, can, I, yeah. can I tell you what, I, what, I, what I've heard about as well? So like, I'm, I'm hearing you say that there are kind of, you know, the way things are done that makes Blacks feel as though they are other and and come secondary within society. And I think that that is, like I can understand how important that is. There, there's another level that I want to just get your feedback on. Um, like when I, when I think, um, as I'm starting to understand what, what you know, structural racism, racism may mean, that it, that it means that there are rules of how society works. And that those rules, perhaps intentionally, perhaps unintentionally, but they disadvantage, seriously disadvantage uh, blacks and, and peoples of color. Um, so one, and one example is an example that just like uh, kind of hits me here because it's, it's one that we're all used to. Like the fact that we 
um, fund our schools with property taxes, which makes sense. Like, what's wrong with that? Except Nobody's going to give that up. Well, Nobody. But I, yeah, not, well, I, but they could. Right. No, so I will say in California, they have you, all the funds now go up to the um, state level and they trickle down to the local level depending on need for jurisdiction. So they don't stay locally anymore. But um, that matters as it, um, it because the, the state can't pay for everything. So uh, depending on where you live, your PFC, your uh, parent faculty club or your PTA, if that's what you're familiar with, um, or PFC, uh, they raise a ton of money locally and are able to pay for the arts teachers and are able to pay for the extra uh, specialists that come in. Um, and that's where you get the uh, well-rounded um, uh, group. So like, yes, the money stays in your locale or your jurisdiction. Um, not so much as it pertains to school funding anymore in that way, um, because they, they've done things to kind of upright that. Um, but in, uh, in other ways that it really matters, that's, that's where you're, you're uh, constantly going to see it. And you're going to see it, and, it, and this is systemically, because there are very few black and brown people that you're going to find that can make it to pay a million dollars for their house, okay, which is the base minimum to live in the Los Virginia school district almost. I think maybe 800000 gets you in. Um, that's, that's a lot of money for a family who 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 uh, who has been kept been out historically kept out of home ownership and and wealth passage matters being able to pass down wealth to be able to I, I I've heard a lot of my friends and I don't begrudge them but they say oh my grandparents or my my parents helped us with the down payment or whatever that matters I, I there are very few black people uh, I think I might know one. I know many black people and I might know one black person who was helped by their parents to put a down payment on their house. And that is because of, like to put in the chat, historic redlining, not us not getting loans. If you look up Bruce's Beach in Manhattan Beach, an entire black family um, had Im their home imminent, their homes, their property in Manhattan Beach, they did imminent domain to get rid of them and build a park. And that's not the only time that's happened. All of Black Wall Street was burned down. So there have been systemic things where we've created our own wealth and created our own superstructures that have been torn apart and, and completely obliterated um, by the Look system. up Tulsa. Look up Tulsa, basically. Oklahoma. Yeah. When you say it's unintentional, oh, it's been intentional. It's intentional. Yeah. So, so I think that this may be one of the things that may be most difficult for for some members of our community to kind of get their hands around, get our hands around. That some, maybe there's sometimes when it's unintentional, but often, often it has been intentional and often it has uh, disenfranchised and, and uh, made it uh, so that black families couldn't gather wealth. We're, we're watching it now. When you say disenfranchisement, I am seeing lines of people uh, in just the midterms uh, trying to vote or just in the, sorry, the primaries recently, trying to vote uh, because they took voting um, out of their, uh, their jurisdiction. So they have to drive miles and then they have to wait in the snow sure. uphill both ways so that they can even have the opportunity to vote. Like these things are intentional. They're not, uh, they're not just by happenstance. So like I, we have doing policies. Yeah, we have policy because the post office, hey, guess what? You and me can afford to do uh, FedEx, right? Or whatever, you know, private entity. But you know what's going to happen is these communities that are underserved and these rural communities even, <laughs> they're not going to have a postal service. They don't have, they're, they're not going to have any type of service to put their bills in the mailbox and then what's going to happen then they're going to get foreclosed on they're going to get dings on their credit like all of these things that seem very like oh whatever i'll just pay the extra bit and go to this private source um the, these people uh there are real consequences for people uh who medicines who medicines absolutely i will i will go even further to say anything that happens to the to black people happens to poor white America. Exactly, I think was just gonna say that. And when we do not take care of black people in this country, whatever the lowest common denominator is, mm -hmm. I know that, that, that white, poor white America thinks yeah. 
that they are going to their their things are going to get better for them. But so many of the services that they think that Black America is using up are services that White America needs. So whether it's a post office to get your medicine, or you know some of these extras that the government provides, it's it's really going to impact everybody in a huge way. And and I, I'm a lift all ships type of person. Like me too. That's what I think. I think like when we come together everyone does well like we if we decide like this is something that we are not going to allow any person in our um our purview or our jurisdiction or uh, across america uh we are gonna have a threshold below which no one is allowed to fall everyone does better it's everyone. like the countries where they educate the women right countries in, that provide education for women will always do better let me uh I have about 75 more questions, uh, but Larry, <laughs> let, me, let me narrow that down to one. Um, and then, yeah. then, then let's see if then there's some questions in the chat box or the rabbi wants to share with us. Um, there's, there's new, de seems like there's new definitions out there in today's world. When I grew up, a racist was the Klan member, the person in the white cape, uh, the person that hated people because of their skin color. Um, those were the racists. That was the, the racism that that we were all taught about as kids, I think most of us. Um, but I'm learning now today that the, maybe the better definition of racism is a syst the system of racial inequality that one, benefits whites, and two, at the expense of blacks and other people of color. And that that is today's racism. That's the, the way we should be maybe reframing our thinking. I am I close? You're close. I am a racist. Like I, 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 I say it and I want people to be able to say it so that they understand that this is not something you intentionally do. Listen, everyone knows not to go to the KKK rally or burn crosses on people's lawns or say the N word, but I've got to tell you that those people are not perpetuating racism every day. It is you and me. And these microaggressions that we continue to perpetuate on people is, uh, that's, it's a death of a thousand cuts. And what ends up happening is that we further suppress people uh, based on these assumptions that we make, uh, even as we think that we are do-gooder people. And I think that I'm a decent person, but I have to tell you that some things come into my mind that are completely unbidden. And I have to say to myself, and only because I've been embarking on this work, right, for so long, I say, ooh, where did that come from? Like there's stuff that, like I, I embody all the isms and I, I want us to all get there where we say, oh, I do that. And I don't, I, I don't know where it comes from, but I definitely don't want to be that. Uh, because of like, listen, nobody is going to the KKK rallies. Uh, punch a Nazi is a holiday, it should be. Like nobody likes all of this stuff. There's a very small percentage of people and they like to be loud but it, they're, not what's, they're not what's keeping racism alive in this country. We are. I would have to agree. And I would say racism also involves a power structure because we have means and, and you know, we're in, we have an education. Kiyomi and I are part of a power structure. We, we acknowledge that. Um, so racism, in fact, is, is being able to le leverage your power and make decisions that could impact somebody else negatively. And one of the things I do is I buy clothing that is made, you know, in countries where they might have child labor. I could do certainly do a lot better with that. I could do better with my recycling because we know that it impacts black mothers more, right? So racism, if for those of you who read, um, you know, just white fragility, it's, it's not a it's not just an either or situation. You're not a bad person. It's not a good, bad binary. If we just say we're all racist, um, then or we're all prejudiced, then then that would be a, a good starting point. I know Elisa is going to put in the chat where you can test your own um, your own unconscious biases, but with a Harvard study that that's been around for many many years that's validated. We can also mail out a list of some microaggressions that you may be doing on a regular basis. I'm gonna warn you though, before you go to a black person or a BIPOC, black indigenous person of color or any person of color and say, but you're a racist too. I, 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 would, I would caution you against doing that because 
the foundation of racism is really those who have power. Who have and power. If you're really prepared yeah. to argue that point, I would, I would steer you away from it. Yeah. I want to make sure that we give a few minutes for uh, members of the congregation who have questions. Uh, to, um, so I want to invite you to go ahead. If you have questions, please put them into the, the chat. Um, I'm just going to take one question from before. Is there any place in the world, any country in the world that you think is a model for the way, the kinds of <laughs> race relations uh, we could or should have? I used to think Singapore, but then I spoke with some Singaporeans who took that assumption right out because they're so diverse, right? But no, nobody, nobody has it right. There's not a company. I've been in the equity and inclusion game for over 15 years and nobody is, nobody has it right because humans were so unpredictable, right? Yeah. We're so tribal and we're so, um, we're, we have this limbic brain that just tells us what to do sometimes. And it's really hard to get out of that, especially during times of stress, which we are all under. So. And it changes shape. It changes the way it looks every day. And that's one thing that I like, certainly in the hour that we've been talking, we didn't end racism, right? But hopefully what we do is spark an idea in your mind like, oh, how do I contribute to this, right? Like, and that is something that I do every day. It's like, oh, how did I contribute to this? Um, because I do. And, um, I, and the more you have that muscle memory, uh, the more you realize like, oh, first of all, it's never done. This work is never done because it changes every day. And, uh, you, but you, you just committed to trying your best. And I, and sometimes I fall short and sometimes I fail and sometimes I owe apologies. Um, but that's okay. We get back up and we keep trying to do better. And tomorrow there's going to be a new terminology to learn and a new understanding of things to learn, be open to that and still keep working at it. The, what you learn over time doing this work is that you're never done. It's, a, it's a, always a process. And I'm gonna add one other thing. Look at me and Kiyomi. The fastest growing ethnic group in this country is mixed race children. Jewish people, we do not proselytize. We grow by adding people who want to be a part of this. And in some cases, having lots of children. We're not growing at the rate. So it behooves us, if we want to grow as a people, we are going to have to welcome people and do a lot better job at doing that because Judaism is an amazing culture. It's an amazing religion and people are drawn to it, but how are we welcoming them into it? And, and I don't want to like turn off your instincts if you feel like, oh my gosh, there's a person that could be a danger to my synagogue. Like I'm not, I'm not trying to advocate for that, but the likelihood that you are going to have an LGBTQ plus member of your family, a black or Latinx member of your family, Asian, you, I'm sure some of you have already seen it and you will. So what I'm asking you today, I'm asking one thing from everybody, whether you have children or not, is to be a good ancestor because that's what we're all here to do on this earth, whether it's leaving a great clean planet for future generations or being kind and creating helping to create a great space for future Jews. The future Jews are going to be some Jews of color, and I promise they will be in your family. So let's figure out how to do this. Um, Barry, I've gotten a question if, if, you, if you don't have any others. Please. Because um, it wasn't on my list of 77, and it's not a Mahjong follow-up. Um, <laughs> You got some Mahjong follow-ups. People who want to play and like some online yeah, stuff. There's a lot of chatting about the Mahjong. and you've Kiyo been Kiyomi Kowalski.com. Uh, <laughs> email me. So uh, the Civil War ended in 1865. Why are reparations important today? Oh, 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 oh I love this one. You want it, April? I'll, I'll give it to you if you need from, it. From, you my si from my sister-in-law. I have some I, thoughts. Tell it. Tell it, April. Germany is still working on some of this. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually applying for German citizenship right now because we, if any of you were kicked out of Germany or you have an ancestor who was, I'm looking at you, sister in love. Um, we still have the ability to do that. So countries still um, have bills. The United States of America has a bill to pay. Mm -hmm. They built this country, this country that is so amazing. Yeah as a bill to pay 
and reparations to pay for black and indigenous people who are still here suffering. And I'm not talking about black people who came from Africa, and, but I can, I can trace my roots. I have pictures of my slave ancestors. And let me tell you who I am. I am a descendant of immigrants. I'm a descendant of the daughters of the American Revolution. And I'm the descendant of slaves and some indigenous people from South America. And, and being the, a daughter-in-law and a daughter and a granddaughter of immigrants, right? Or, you know, somewhere in there, I still believe there's a bill to pay. And so if you came after, if your family came to a place that still has a bill, they just picked the wrong place because there's yeah, still and, a bill to pay. And um, like, it wasn't long ago. I do think that we have this idea that this was like so long ago. My great, great grandfather was a slave. Like it wasn't so long ago. And not only that, then after that, they had Jim Crow. Then after that, like all of the policies that were put in place, redlining and things to intentionally keep people out of, of, of certain areas. Yeah, we have a bill to pay. You, we have a significant bill to pay. And that is why reparations are necessary. Uh, it, it, it doesn't just go away. We didn't just say, oh, hey, there's no more slavery. And we didn't even say, which would have been smart, is uh, 40 acres and a mule to like make it up to you. Let me let you uh, run your land. And like we had an agrarian society at the time. We didn't do any of that. We said, good luck to you. And we're going to try to keep you out of every single uh, thing that would, would help you along in this world. Absolutely, we have a thing to pay. And that, and that bill is still coming due. And, and, and we still owe, based on everything that happened, another, yet another Black man was just murdered from, by the police. We have a, a, a strong bill to pay. So um, we, we're, we're coming close to the, to the time that we kind of allotted and we want to thank you for your time. Is there any last, you've given us a lot of food for thought. Is there any last thing you want us to, to hear? Is there anything else that you want to share with us to help us as we move forward in our journey? I love you. That's why I I'm here. I to say. That's, dude, that's, I love you. That's why I'm here. Like I, like, I want you to understand that this is exhausting. It ain't fun. I don't want to do this. I don't want to. I, I feel like when I have these conversations, I, I think they're really important. And I do them because I, I owe some back time. I have a bill due too, because for a very long time, I, I, uh, I harbored white supremacy in my heart. I am a, a, a different person now and I owe that bill. And this is my bill coming due. But I have to tell you, the reason I'm here is because I love you. I love this community. I love our people. And I want us to do better. And I want to help us do better. And I'm going to stay at this table. And I'm going to keep talking to anyone who is willing to listen so that we can, uh, we can move through this. We are one people. Mm -hmm. Blacks and Jews are one people. And, and, and the sooner we can figure that out, the way we have been treated in the world, the way that the world has looked at us for being different, has there's so many similarities, there are too many similarities to ignore. I love my community, I love both of my communities. It breaks my heart regularly to see this disconnect, especially in my own family. It's so great. Like all my cousins are black and are bluish, black and Jewish, Jubian princesses and Hebrews. Yay! So if we manage to like you know, get this going, at least in my family, in a really strong, powerful way. And I, and I just, I want that for our Jewish family. I want that connection. I think when we connect and have stories um, told, it's, it's really important. One other thing I'd also like to add, if you want to um, connect with, with us on Facebook, we are having a Cocktails with Kiyomi party. Um, to get to know her, if you're curious about voting for L in LVUSD, if you're, if you're still interested after getting to know me just this little bit. <laughs> and, I, and I want you to know, culturally, we're animated, you know, like we, yeah. that's, that's who we are. We get animated and excited and, um, but Google the hashtag, hashtag cocktails with a K, cocktails with Kiyomi, if you want to know more about that. But um, thank you all for your time. Like, thank oh. you for having us and investing the time. That was a lot, it's a long time to sit and just listen to two people without any music or drama or anything. Um, and, I think and we brought the drama, did we not? Like, were we not dynamic? I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to answer that question. But, <laughs> but, but but April, who who does this professionally, so thank you for doing it on your on your off hours too. Um, and and our our payment, thank you. 
and and Kiyomi, who uh, you're 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 doing a million things, including uh, running for school board. Thank you both for your time, your patience, your not laughing at my questions, um, your stories, uh, your insight in helping us to uh, helping us to repair the world and helping us to 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 the first this next step. And before I turn it back over to the rabbi. Let me just remind everybody, this should just be a starting point for our discussions. We are forming discussion groups so white people can talk to other white people and um, continue because I've got a million more questions and comments and I'm even, I've got like a 20 minute closing argument here, but I'm not giving it. I'm just going to say, join our discussion groups. Um, let's watch the movies and talk and figure out what we can do as a community to maybe repair the world. And that's our calling as Reformed Jews, to Olam. So, uh, thank you both, and back to you, Rabbi Diamond. So, uh, again, thank you to Kiyomi and to April, to Dan, uh, and to everyone on the committee that helped to, to put this together. Um, I just wanted to tell you the, the pride at seeing um, 80, 83, 84 households, uh, 81 still on. Uh, it was 88 it, it, it at really, the top. It, 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 and, and the people who are going to be watching afterwards, I can't tell you how proud that makes me um, as, a, as a rabbi. Um, but I also, I just want to give one, one, one person, as they, were talk, uh, as they were typing, they said, you know, all lives uh, matter. Um, and then after you talked, because you explained things, they said, oh, I didn't understand the implications of that. Now I know. Thank you. And they said, I'm not going to be using that language in the same way that I didn't realize what it means. And, and then just as this one person, no, I'm telling no. you, it was all worth it, April. We just uh, stopped racism. <laughs> yes, look at us. My, my, my tagline is one heart at a time. I, I believe I, it. It's one heart at a time because I'm being a good ancestor. Yeah, uh, no, I'm okay. almost in tears. I want to Thank invite you. our Thank members to be so able much. to I want you to be able to disagree. I want you to be able not just to, to argue devil's advocate just for the sake mm -hmm. of, but to, but to struggle out loud with this stuff, mm -hmm. to say, I don't necessarily agree with stuff. I don't understand all the stuff. I don't get it yet. And to be able to join these groups and say, okay, here's where I am. Let's talk about it. Is there something else that we need to explore? Let's find out more information. To do this work in small groups of people who are not gonna be here to judge each other, but who are gonna be here to explore together. I I think when we do that, we really do uh, improve this community and we improve ourselves. So again, thanks to all of you. I hope to see you in groups um, and I, I uh, wish you a, a good night to all. Rabbi, is the chat okay. going to be available for people? The uh, I can, I can. I'm make... saving the chat. Yes. Elisa. And of course you can email us at any time. I'm a key. Kowalski for school board at gmail.com. Email me. I'd love to talk to you. I, I'm, I'm into not, this work. But I, I, I'm all over social media at April F. Powers. There, there, Twitter, were, um, there were a lot of resources. There were a lot of resources put in the chat box. So I just want to make sure that people have them available. We'll have them on our, we'll try to form yes. some kind of a site for people at the, at the temple website. And I, yep. I just want to acknowledge Sisterhood for their flexibility with the program that was going to be tonight and uh, the uh, Torah study for their flexibility. We know that we kind of knocked you out and the fact that you have made this possible through your flexibility is something that is very meaningful to me and us. So thanks to all of you. Toda rabba. Toda rabba. Toda. 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 Toda.